counteraction is what controls the length of the scene, the intensity of the scene, whether it's um, a, a negotiation or a conflict, whether it is collaborative or it's not collaborative, and it even controls much, not all, but much of the style of the piece, which is why this works with non-realism as well. So um, that's my two cents on the history. Because it is, and it has become my mission since writing Stanislavski in focus, and I've been doing much more work on this last studio in recent years and on active analysis. Because for my money, active analysis is what's going to take us into the future. So I want to respond, if I may, just to a couple of things that happened here. Okay. First thing is, you said that there was a history and your history was right there in the images and I love the suffragettes, I have to tell <laughs> <laughs> I love the suffragettes, that's where I would really kind suffragettes, of very, yeah. right? Okay, but I, I, I want to just react to that a little bit mm -hmm. because I, in my own work with active analysis, I have had the great good fortune to work with scientists. In fact, sometimes scientists are a lot more fun to play with. And I just wanted to say one thing about the past leading to the future in that regard, because the first time um, a group of scientists came to me and said, we're building intellectual virtual agents. It's called IVA. <laughs> we're building IVAs. They have a very rich emotional environment that they live in. But what we can't figure out is how to make them more interactively emotional, and we want you to help us because acting can help us. So can you teach our inter, inter uh, our IBAs to act? Hmm. That was the first question, and I went, hmm. This is very interesting because the standard with a Stanislavski approach to an actor is say, well, um, you know, how would you, what would you do if you were in these circumstances? And I don't think I can ask that of an intelligent virtual agent because they don't have a past really, they're sort of just built. So we actually found that the first thing we did was go to the past mm. and started working with Del Sartre. Mm -hmm. which is another aspect that took me into the laboratory. So going to Del Sartre with the laboratory, speaking to you and your history of the laboratory, his laboratory for art, of course, and some of you probably know the history of Del Sartre, a uh, singer who lost his voice, who wanted to figure out better ways to train. And so his laboratory were the Parisian morgues, mm -hmm. because what he was looking to was to understand the gestures of the dead as expressions of emotion. And it starts with that, and he developed this very complicated season. And I told this to the scientists on an impulse. The next week they came back. They had read everything they could find. <laughs> and they go, we like it. And we started to experiment with gestures coming out of Del Sartre to see how people would read them. So I wanted to link past to future because mm -hmm. what I loved about that moment is how the past will often take us to the future. Yes. And then the second uh, time, and this was actually the great good fortune of being um, sponsored by a National Science Foundation, a group of engineers came to me and said, well, we want to study um, how actors create emotion. And of course, we all know that the last thing you say to an actor is, go out there and be angry. <laughs> you know, so I said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. So, um, but what we did is we created, um, under this grant, a company of 12 actors who worked exclusively through active analysis, all in motion capture. Mm. So what we did were scenes from Chekhov's Shakespeare and contemporary scenarios that we devised, a series of things, for two years just in a motion capture studio. And so that was the other you know, past to mm -hmm. future mm -hmm. 
Uh, I mean, I really love the fact that um, what I found was that the work that I had been playing with for so long with active analysis was so amenable to technology because it worked seamlessly in this technology. And it was really a fascinating piece for me as an actor to discover that presence is not grounded. It is grounded to the body, yes, but it's not necessarily grounded to photographic image. Yeah. Because the aspect of seeing actors working in motion cap top capture technology as just dots on a screen, we're not talking about coming in and bringing animators to give them new bodies, but to just see the dots on the screen moving through space using active analysis to work in scenes, it was utterly legible what their emotional inf information was, what the hierarchy was within the scenes, um, you know, whether there was a power struggle was clear, and we knew who every actor was. <laughs> The because presence, of rhythms? the rhythms were so specific to the actors that it really became um, a sense of presence. And I thought that that was something that in terms of having the ability to, to work experimentally, melding science to art at this point, um, using a technique that was developed in the late 1930s. Um, and this is the last thing I'm going to say, well, I promise, <laughs> because I don't, I want the conversation, but this is the last thing I'm going to say. Um, in working with the scientists, I discovered something very <coughs> interesting about Stanislavski in return. Because um, that's what I love about the scientists, and it was like uh, what John, Brit John, and Britton and I—we were talking this morning, right? One of the things that I loved most about working with the scientists is none of us knew what the hell we were doing. We got into a room, we were talking different languages, we knew what we wanted to study, we had ideas, but it really—it was the first time I can honestly say I had no idea what was going to happen. Because when you write a book or when you go in with a group of actors, you do have a goal. You do come in with some sense of what you want to see. And you do adjust it and you do change it, but rarely are we totally in waters other that, that we cannot guess. And, 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 and what I loved about working with them was that being off balance and searching together with different vocabularies, and they did teach me things. One of the okay, so okay, so the last thing is that I really did discover scientists who had been studying actors and finding that the uh, cognitive scientists who found that the brains of actors really are following in the paths that active analysis works. So that's the last thing that I would say. It seems that he was prescient in the sense that observant. he laid out something. An yes, observant. He was that, in the laboratory of human beings and he was watching them and he spent his life doing it. And that. there is some actuality there. Yeah. <laughs> 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 sorry, sorry. To, to, plug, to plug into this, uh, Sharon will also be um, expanding on this work in a sort of workshop uh, setting tomorrow morning for about 90 minutes. Uh, so again, just plug in the workshops in the morning. Um, <laughs> shall we move on to, to, to Jose and the... Yeah? Hello, how are you? Yeah, the introduction. Um, sure. so, <laughs> So, so please, so, so, so we're very, uh, we're going to uh, move on to the terminology and, and begin the um, ensemble roundtable discussion by um, introducing uh, uh, Jose Luis Valenz uh, Venezuela. Is that Valenzuela. Sorry. Valenzuela. And, um, and the uh, and the uh, uh, and his company. Yes. Great. 
It's interesting to me to I I I'm a professor at UCLA, but I, I'm not an academic. I'm the head of the directing program for the MFA directors, and uh, you know, and I don't care that much. Uh, uh, I have a, an ensemble theater company, and when I talk about it, and I, talk, I have a friend who we just hired from the city company who's living with us, and I say, you know, what is an ensemble and what is a collective? Mm -hmm. My company has been together for 30 years, the same actors. Uh, uh, two of them died already, so th th we don't have the entire company, and one has left uh, to be a film star. So, but we are still together and, and since night. So I, I, th this, I just show some photographs that you, you can just play in the okay. paper for seven minutes. Right. It's nothing very specifically, but I'm trying to figure out how we, as a company, coming from the tradition of Chicano theater, uh, I'm a Chicano, from, you know, so we exist for by deed, not necessarily our theater company exists as a response to a need to have our history, or issues, or justice, and our politics to talk about mm -hmm. as Mexicans in the United States. Mm -hmm. You know, it, 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 our exploration is how we are going to record our history and what images of how we are going to create pieces of work that are not created by playwrights in the United States because they usually own the tradition mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, even the American playwrights or Latino playwrights they still have like the tradition of psychological drama, which we it, it, it really doesn't serve many times our purpose as trying to show our history or the images that we want to show or, or the social justice issues that we want to show because the American theater, unfortunately, you know, after the 80s, it turns out to be, you know, that it's not what they're talking about. So all our, our theater is not necessarily in the way you guys are searching for form and style to create something. It's really much more an order to say something and to talk about our mm -hmm. community in or, in or in what it needs to be talked about. So usually start with research about what are the, this is about AIDS, which is an, un, you know, we don't talk about homosexuality, we don't talk about AIDS in the Latino community, you know. So it's important to us to deal with issues much more important than with the form. And, and, and so we start usually with research, with lots of research, and usually pieces will take from two to four years to be created mm -hmm. because it takes us for a very, very long process. So sometimes when you see these photographs, you see photographs that are, you know, are the same play in three or four different uh, generations because we do workshops and we do more workshops. And, 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 and the way we work, the actors propose the ideas of what the story or the scenery, or whatever is going to happen. And, and how that will push, you know, what the issue is going to be, and what's the most effective way for us to talk to our own community uh, about what the situation is. So it's interesting to me, too, because you know, I work in the academia at UCLA. I listen a lot of these conversations, and, uh, but what, what our company does is not necessarily we don't, we don't discuss it in the same way that you do because in a way, our basic is politics. Mm -hmm. Our basic is the community and what the issues are. Uh, and yet the forms are so potent. So at what point and in what way do the forms begin to emerge out of the deep research into the issues and the effective ways of communicating them? Of course, I meaning the form, but is it, we don't go from the form, to, we, we the, the content the determines the form. Yeah. And, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and this comes from a very important Latin American, from the Latin American theater during the dictatorships mm -hmm. in Colombia, especially in Colombia, in Uruguay with El Galpón, or El Teatro Experimental de Cali, or all these companies who could not speak openly about the political issues they created a methodology, which is called the collective creation, in the context that was given to us in the 1970s, as when they began to have a relationship, and the other experimental 
you know, and we then taught us how to arrive to the image that it had a lot more powerful in the other side. So in the process, if you want to, some of the stories, the, the, the first time we tell the story of what the idea is, is a total silence. Mm -hmm. There is no text. Mm -hmm. So the entire way mm -hmm. the work is done for the first part of the context, because it's all research, political research of text from journals or, you know. So it has to be told silently before any text comes in. Mm -hmm. and, and the text doesn't mean words. It can just be music. It can just be a piece of poetry. And then how we got all this, because I mean, Semyon, which is a shell player, you know, uh, who came in and contextualized an entire piece for us. And because we work together for months and months and months. And months and months. Right? It's not like something is created and four weeks. Like mm -hmm. I think solitude took us around three years, which is solitude comes from uh, the Labyrinth of Solitude, which is a, a Nobel Prize book, which is really a set, an essay about Mexican psychic in Mexico with the chapter in Mexican psychic in the United States very controversial in, in, in the United States Mexican community because the way he thought the psychic of this, of who we are. Mm -hmm. And it's really a book of, of essays that it took us a very long time to try to figure out how do we talk about and contextualize the work. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a Nobel Prize uh, book, you know, of what the psychic of Mexican and the United States is. We give a very clear audience, in a way, which is the, the Mexican-American, the Latino audience of the United States, and which is really big for us. I mean, if I do a Latino play, I, I'm the artistic director of the Los Angeles Theater Center. So we, we produce not only Latino work, but we produce African-American, you know, mm -hmm. Asian, you know, white, and all kinds of, of, of play. And but when we do the Latino work, it's you know, we have huge audiences in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, uh, and you so also do large outdoor uh, spectacles, or you, or you were before, yes? The, did, don't you do an annual pageant? We do La Virgen, uh -huh. which is a, 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 a pageant, which is all as done with the community. That has many months of her, so we begin mm -hmm. now in, in different community mm -hmm. centers and in parks to bring families to participate, and the cast is around 125, 150 people, and the company, the ensemble, which is the title of us now, uh, play the main roles. Mm -hmm. And we presented two, two days only inside the cathedral, mm -hmm. and there's 4,000 people a night that come to see it. Mm -hmm. And it's in Spanish, and it's, uh, you know, uh, we, I just came back from Norway, I did Pierre Gay, mm -hmm. uh, and outside to, with a, a cast of around 100 people, kind of using the using same. Pageantry? Yeah, the same methodology that we use for the again. Could you talk a little bit to the kind of collective creating aspect of pageantry? Because obviously you need you need directorial yeah, yeah, yeah. strategies, and at the same time you're dealing with huge numbers of people. Uh, could you talk about it? Well, so I mean, it, it, I had directed it in Scandinavia a lot, and I did it again in '95 inside the theater. But this time they asked me to propose if I can come and work. Ibsen was born in Xi'an, you know, which is two hours north of Oslo. So the, the city of Xi'an is where the Ibsen Theater of Norway is, because they own Ibsen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But they, it's like a county, it's called a county, and they were they have in elections now about, uh, you know, and the, uh, the, the conservative group is very strong trying to take over the culture. Now, in Norway, the arts are 100% subsidized. So there's, they don't understand fundraising or anything like that. Uh, so the, the, uh, the artists, the, the people are very interested in fighting against the, uh, you know, the election for mm -hmm. happened on Monday. So they had proposed to me to come. They came and saw La Virgen, mm -hmm. even though I have worked in Norway before. And they wanted me to do something like that with Pierre Ging, which is like their Bible. Mm -hmm. This is like the play for them. And they wanted me to see if I can work with the entire town. Mm -hmm. Because they needed 
they need uh, the people mm -hmm. in the county to support the theater mm -hmm. because it's the, 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 the resident theater in that county is the theater they use it. So we went to the military and we talked to the military, the military has an orchestra, you know, <laughs> that, that we talked to them about how they can be part of mm -hmm. the production and maybe the orchestra can do the music and maybe we can perform it and then in the and the and the navy base which it was outside. There are photos in there you can <laughs> have out here again. So we did uh, and then they have what is called the amateur companies, you know, which are the amateur theater companies that are around. So we met with the amateur companies to see if they wanted to participate in this project. So we got 60 amateurs, you know, 30 people in the orchestra, and, and the program, which were 18 professional actors. And, and we decided to do it in the middle of the county, not necessarily either in Oslo or so the rehearsals, I had to rehearse with the orchestra, and you know, military orchestras, they read music, as some they do. It's not necessarily the same as trying to get them to move. You know, you have to be playing, and you're gonna be moving, and you're gonna have to be part of the scenes, and you have to, you know, be part of the people, because I have to conceptualize this particular Pergin as a Mario Pergin in this country. You know, with these people, and this play was for this particular character, not necessarily for the world, yes, for them. And uh, so we, we rehearsed with the orchestra in the morning for three hours, and then we rehearsed with the principal, and then we rehearsed at night with the amateur. So we rehearsed for 12, 12 weeks, around three and a half months. And uh, it, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, now that I mean, to go back every other year to create it as a tradition the same way we do not weekend every year. Now they want me to do it every other year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that I can do it every other year. <laughs> 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 so, so, but it's a, it's a very interesting process being that for us as a theater company is very, very important to, to do. But again, this is historically why? Because the association outside of Norway, with Ibsen as the father of realism, even though he was so very much more, and obviously Pierre Lynch is not within that yeah. realist tradition, we know that. But so the idea of this kind of big sort of revolve of forms and concerns and ways of making theater, and this, this work of the Chicano theater then being brought into the work with Ibsen, yeah. is again this kind of story of, of histories going round and round and round and talking to each other. Yeah, I think it's very, very little. I mean, it's only three books written about, Ch about Chicano theater, and, and unfortunately, and and because people have to done the research, and, uh, uh, we just got a grant to my wife got a grant to be a fellowship in this in order to document to do the, the research for our own company. We've been doing it for thirty years, and get on the documents then for a book to be written mm -hmm. about the the. The methodology mm. of what we have been doing for the last thirty years, because we can know. But that's that's the question. But this is it's an, it's an amazing um, you know history here of your ensemble as well. From starting out as it, it, you've gone through different permutations of the kind of responsibilities of your ensemble, yes? Like as a, as a small company and then into a we repertory we theater. Actually, we were theater. actually born at the LNDC as uh -huh. a laboratory. Uh -huh. And you were talking about laboratory. Yes, yes. And it was really a very important laboratory in 90. When Bill Bushnell and Diane White, who created the Los Angeles Theater Center, came to me because we had done a, a play in, in kind of successful, and, and, and they came and said, what you need, and this is very important for, for I think, for theater makers. Uh, I say I only want a room eight hours a week to create a laboratory to experiment mm -hmm. how you can tell the own story uh -huh. with that. And that was in 1985. And you know, really, so it happened. He gave me a room every Tuesday and Thursday night for four hours. Mm -hmm. 
and, and I wanted money because I was married and I had a son and said, I need a job. Mm. And he goes, if we have a job in accounting. And I said, I'm a great accountant. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it goes. <laughs> but it went from the laboratory where we were creating stories and uh, uh, it was, you know, we created the first collective creation. And, and, and during the time, you know, we went outside, what are the issues affecting our communities and such? And we created a first collective creation inside what it was, a regional theater. Mm -hmm. But I always found it fascinating to see if it was possible to do that. We went from being a laboratory, then we did the first collective creation, uh -huh. and then it was very successful and, and for them and the box office that then we continued. We, we, when, when the LITC closed down in 1991 and declared bankruptcy, our company locked ourselves inside the building mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, to tell the city and the county that this was a public building for theater, mm -hmm. that it should not disappear, you know? And they were able to open it up, but we moved to the music, to the paper. They, uh -huh. they came to us, Gordon Davidson came mm -hmm. to us and moved the company to the paper. And we created something called the Latino Theater Initiative mm -hmm. in there, which mm -hmm. was a, a, another idea of creating an ensemble inside the big theater and taking over the main stage. You know. Yeah. But we left and we come back to the LATC in 2003, and now it's, it's our theater. And, and yes, meaning we were now, they all have, we all, an ensemble in a <coughs> company has. <coughs> financial responsibilities, you know. Yeah, Talk about that, because that's something we haven't really made, do we have time? We, we have kind of need to move into okay. the next thing, but if, I mean, I definitely right. want to hear it, and we can maybe fold it into how yeah. John's going to moderate, and just, and we got some new people moving in, I just need to get the hangouts up. Um, so if anybody needs to grab drinks, do feel free to grab some food, some drink. We're going to take a lunch break in about an hour and a half. Um, so we're just going to move into like an ensemble round table, um, and, um, I'm going to pass off to um, John, uh, and um, I'll get some people up on Hangout. So maybe we take a minute or two breaks. Yeah. Tea Say 
had to scout profit. I'm going to try to turn you guys around uh, so you can see the conversation. When I'm going to play a little bit like that, I'm going to have a little bit more. Can you see? Hello, Scott. <laughs> 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 Adam Ledger. Hello, Adam. I need to try to. Uh, <laughs> I'm Catherine. Hi, Catherine. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> Strange way to do it. This is wild. This is very it's very kind of thrilling and funky and strange. What was that? <laughs> yep, yep. Yes, <laughs> Oh, it's Rachel. Uh, and then, Rachel, are you there? It said she was. It said she was. Rachel, you, a picture of you appeared? She just joined the chat. If you can hear us, Rachel, just shout. Um, shout. Or type in something. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, right now we're setting this up, yeah. So we're 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 bringing people into virtually into the space. So, hey, Rachel. There we go. Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you were asking about a room to warm up. I would think uh, yeah, we'll oh, all show me up. I can't hear you, Rachel. But I'm missing bits. Yeah, I mean, it's a little exposed. If you have the studio, will be, uh, do do everybody will be out there. First, first. And so you guys go in. How last, long last do you do it? Am I going first? Oh, sorry. Like so that's just that's six fifty. Yeah, but we're going to. You talk about the developing pieces. Yeah, yeah. So now we're going to do it. So okay, hey there. Yeah, I'll let you know. And then what you're doing with this end point, the idea of this open point. Perfect. So I'm going to put you at that time. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. You will not disappear. That's what I. It doesn't disappear. Yeah. So it's really and of the impulse and the impulse and the counteraction, right, into an almost modern art abstract body. And then I heard that what I would like to do is understand more emotional situation is to explore the language of all the mechanics in terms of the way identical investigation in different human terms, but it's the same structures. Um, and it's really beautiful. It's what I always hear when I hear it. Okay, can you be quiet in there? Quiet. Oh, now you're just brings me back to my roots of the how are you? Good. This is Adam Ledger. You see Adam too, right? Hi, Rachel. Hi, Rachel. What about all you, Rachel? Uh, I am in Connecticut. Okay. And you? Uh, I'm in Birmingham, in the middle of the UK. Okay. Sure. <laughs> it is. I don't quite know what's going to happen. I mean, it was spiritual for him to even drops it after 1915. Yes. So what's in this? And what's that? No. Have you been watching via the the live feed? For a bit, for about a half hour. Oh, good. So you did. So you got. So so you got. You you got to hear that whole lot. Could you see the images? Sharon? Yeah. No, we didn't see the images. We just saw Sharon. Oh, no, no, no. Who was Sharon? 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 Who was Shar
who was sharing? Um, oh, who is after Sharon? Um, uh, that was Luis, who teaches at uh, UCLA. And um, uh, I'm going to mangle the name of his company, but he runs a major Chicano theater company, and he's been doing this for 30 years. And the images were stunning, and so he began by talking about how all of this was driven by um, by the research into the issues first and the forms afterward. But then he talked about the importance of tech and the Teatro de Cali um, in the yeah. 70s in giving them a way of working where they would start first from they would start first from telling the story purely visually before they would bring in the language and that's what drove the imagery but there was never the discussion about form because it was always rooted into the deep research and the politics and the images that he yeah the Teatro de Cali which is really yeah text so this is the stuff that we just started to touch on at the end um, and then, did you get to hear what Sharon was talking about? So, you know, and did you hear the beginning? Good, because she was talking. Uh, she was she was talking about Stanislavski's devising work at the end. Um, yeah. And then also, this would have been Adam. I don't, did you get to hear Sharon a little bit, Adam? Okay, so because at the end she was talking about, and this was what I've given you about, the Russian tradition of devising off of literary text, the adaptation tradition. And it's beneath that that a lot of the collective creation work is hidden because you still have strong authoritarian leadership in many companies, and yet it is deeply collaboratively devised work in terms of rehearsal processes. So there's a lot to explore there about these sort of hidden hidden working relationships of, 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 of group work. Great. Yeah. It was really good to hear that. It was good to hear that. Yeah. Um, and there was some talk yesterday about the magazine. Okay, apparently things are happening. I'm going to go away. <laughs> I just wanted to introduce uh, our, our virtual guests since we finally have them. Um, uh, so it's a big, big leap for us in, in bringing in some virtual participation and seeing how this all goes. Um, we have on the, on the bottom of the screen, uh, in, the, in the bar there, uh, starting from left to right, we've got Adam Ledger. Who, uh, Adam Ledger is in, uh, is in the UK. Oh, there's a lovely um, echo. And just put out a wonderful book on the Odin Teatrit. Absolutely. Adam just put out a wonderful book on the Odin Teatrit. Uh, and he's doing some. Mm -hmm. So he's been very busy, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Indeed. And he's doing some. And then that's, that's us, obviously. Um, in the, in <laughs> <laughs> and then we have uh, Rachel Rayburn Anderson. And Rachel devises, Rachel teaches collaborative creation, and Rachel writes on collective creation. And among other writings, she has a chapter in the second of these two books, and she'll be contributing a chapter on women and devising in New York to a new piece of work that was going to lead to Scott Proudfit, that Scott Proudfit and I are developing on women and collective creation. Yes, and, and Scott Proudfit is the last uh, little uh, window there. And <laughs> Scott is... Uh, My wonderful collaborator. Many of you may remember... And other things, he also has a... Very He's been the associate editor for these two books as well, and um, uh, many of you may remember him or have known him before when he was uh, a, a staple of the LA theater community. Yeah. And has written wonderful work on the CT Company, among others, based on both personal experience and historical investigation. Uh, and one final, just quick comment I wanted to make is if anybody doesn't uh, want, feels like they want to be on stage and doesn't have a chair, just do let us know. We can, I'm sure we can rustle up some more chairs somewhere. Yeah, because we don't have enough chairs on stage. Uh, <laughs> yes. Okay. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, hand it over to to, to Mr. Britton, who is Amy is going to moderate this conversation. Okay, well, see, I don't know what moderate <laughs> means. Um, so I don't know, I'm just going to... Please don't go to extremes. I'm just, you know, I'm just... <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to say. Nothing controversial, possibly. Um, those of us who are here, those of us who are here virtually, um, I'm going to talk for a few minutes, and then I really just encourage you, if you if you prepared a presentation and you'd like to say, hold on, me now, I want to talk, just shout me now, I want to talk. Um, I'd kind of just like us to let things flow 
but there is also a number of prepared uh, preparations that we'll try to get to in the course of about an hour we have, don't we? Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, we've got, we, yeah, we've got about an hour. We can go a little bit longer if we need to. Okay. Also, we, we, we just on a very quick side note, we got the most amazing cheesecake. <laughs> 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 Courtesy of Most important. The Lara brought the most amazing, and I'm going to bring them here because they're still warm, oh. and I've never had anything like that. So I've never been my life. All of a sudden, you have a cheesecake. Cheese and cherries. They're here. Okay, and those of you who are joining us virtually, I'm really sorry you can't access the cheesecake. Uh, it's yeah, really big. it's uh, cruel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that was fun. Yeah. Okay, so. I'm going to just try to kick this off a little bit by, we've been talking about terminology and I want to play with the word ensemble because one of the things that's been really interesting in putting together this book, Encountering Ensemble, is it forced me to encounter the word ensemble and to realize that I really had no idea what it meant. And as I went through the process of writing the book and getting contributions from people like Brian and Mark Valdez, who's here, and Scott, and so on and so forth, realizing that none of us know what it meant, and that either we can come to a decision that it means nothing, and therefore we should stop using it, or that it's a beautiful, complex, wonderful world that means, word that means many, many things, and that to attempt to impose some kind of this is ensemble, this is not, is entirely against the spirit of what ensemble is supposed to represent. This is one of my passions. I believe in you know, the meeting of irreconcilable differences and how we negotiate those differences aesthetically, politically, culturally, historically. Um, so I want to just pick out a couple of things about, about the difficulty of the word ensemble. And it will talk already to some of the presentations that we've had this morning. I won't particularly make links to those presentations because you can make the links yourselves, but already we're talking into something that exists in this room. So when I started to work with, okay, let's, what do people mean when they, they talk about ensemble? I came across a few definitions that people were very definite about. Uh, Equity and the Directors Guild of Great Britain put together a conference on ensemble and they said, what is ensemble? And they said, basically ensemble is when a group of people work together for a long time. Cool, so all West End and Broadway shows are ensembles, presumably all soap operas are ensembles. Uh, I have a problem. What happens if somebody leaves? What happens if somebody new joins? Does it stop being an ensemble? Because they haven't been working together for a long time, or somebody's left. Yeah, longevity. It's important, but it's not enough to define ensemble. It's an element, but it's not a definition. Some people talk about ensemble as there being a shared creative team. One of the definitions is that you need an artistic director and a designer and a writer and a stage manager who work together that they bring in actors uh, on a project by project basis and somehow this is an ensemble. Yeah, I'm comfortable with that as an element of ensemble. It talks about continuity of style. It talks about continuity of aesthetic and development of aesthetic. Again, I, it doesn't work for me because I've got my own approaches to ensemble, but I'm perfectly happy with it as a set of understandings. Katie Mitchell, who was referenced earlier, who's a, a director of enormous intelligence and, intelligence and skill, but she uses the word ensemble in her book, The Director's Handbook, in a really interesting way. And she says, when you're rehearsing, blah, 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 try to call the ensemble together for at least one hour a week. I mean, hold on, you're using the word ensemble to suggest a group of people who only meet for up to one hour a week during a whole rehearsal process. And we could just dismiss that as a weak use of the word. But no, Katie Mitchell's a really intelligent woman. She references inspiration from Gazi Nietzsche and from Pina Bausch. She's talking about an aspiration. She's talking about even under commercial pressure and box office pressure, make sure people all end up in the same room at the same time so that you have a shared purpose. Even if you don't have the working structures that enable you all to be in the same room at the same time, for God's sake, remember we are in a common endeavor even if we don't get to talk to each other very much. Some people talk about ensemble absolutely as a non-hierarchical structure. I, was at a, I ran a symposium a few years ago from which this book was actually generated, and the dancer said, oh, we dancers are years ahead of you. We got, a di got rid of directors years ago, which is neither true nor, I think, relevant. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 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 OK, I'm a director. OK, back off. <laughs> I, you know, I, because 
my understanding of ensemble are not directly related to questions of hierarchy <coughs> and company structure. But okay, this may be where I divulge from some other area, but let's you know, sit with this divergence a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to suggest, and yeah, before I suggest, I also think that there is a markedly different use of the word ensemble in America to the use of the word in Europe and England. And I want to just sort of talk to that a little bit. So I'd like to suggest that we might think that when we use the word ensemble, there are really two quite different things that have been talked about, which ultimately combine to form one thing. But there's two different things. I was really fascinated when uh, Brian, uh, in your presentation, talked about science as moving from a knowledge to an activity. Mm -hmm. and I think this talks to something quite interesting. One way that we can talk about ensemble is ensemble as a psychophysical act. Okay, what do I mean by that? I mean ensemble as this sense that you get when you watch something of shared breath of people really swinging together. Uh, Lee Worley from the Roper talks about uh, ensemble as a jazz band. Not only do they play great music, but there's the indefinable swinging in there. Joan Littlewood also talked about ensemble as a jazz, not as a symphony okay. orchestra, but as a jazz combo, which is really dangerous in the 50s and 60s in England. You know. uh, it's kind of this thing. Ensemble is something that happens between actors on stage. That thing where we go, yeah, I see the performance. I see what you're doing, but there's something in there that makes me go, wow, that's alive. It's a psychophysical action, by which I mean it is something that actors do, live in front of the performers every single time they perform. And as a director of ensemble, it's fascinating to me. It happened in every bloody production. You do all this work building the ensemble. And then about a week before, you do a run, and everything's great and in place, and it's just not ensemble. <laughs> it's just not there. They're not doing it. They're doing everything except it. And so you get this sense that ensemble, you can build it and build it and build it, but if the actors don't do it, it ain't there. So we have this idea of ensemble as something that you can train, something that you can develop, which is a series of ways of being with each other, relationships, what you might call <coughs> psychophysical action, because it's about the relationship between the mind and the body, and how the body and the mind are on stage in relationship with other actors. And that can happen within strictly hierarchical structures, it can happen in all sorts of places, or it can happen in you know, democratic structures. So we have the possibility of talking about ensemble as a psychophysical thing. What do people do on stage? And then we have another discussion of ensemble, which is ensemble as an ethical question. By ethics, I need to be clear what I'm saying. I'm not saying that I think it's a better choice. People talk about ethical buying, <laughs> as being better buying. No, I don't mean that. I mean ensemble, which is based on an agreed shared set of behaviors, an agreed shared set of moralities, perhaps an agreed set of set, shared set of politics. Ways that people choose to be together. And some things are acceptable in the rehearsal space and some things are not acceptable in the rehearsal space. Sometimes some people are acceptable in the rehearsal space and some not. If you're working in um, a single gender company, you know, men can't be in a, fe a, feminine, a female company, a fe women can't be in an all male company. There's certain things that are acceptable and not acceptable because those things are considered necessary for the creative process that the team want to make to happen. Uh, one of some of the great feminist work in the 70s, I was talking mm -hmm. to the, one of the founders of Monstrous Regiment in England in, in a few months ago. And you know, she was saying quite clearly, for us, a group of women, to make this work, we needed to be in a room without men. Absolutely, you know, that was the heart of their ethics. It needed to happen that way, and, and so it continues. We need to find spaces where we are free to tell our own stories and free to um, work with the people we need to work with. And those are really ethical questions. Mm -hmm. Now, I think, and I'm very happy to be told that I'm wrong, but I think that over the last 20 years, what 
the ethical dimension of ensemble has become more important in American thinking than the psychophysical dimension of ensemble. I'm happy to be told I'm wrong. I also think that in a lot of European understandings of ensemble, the psychophysical dimension has become stronger than the ethical dimension. Mm. I, this is in, intended to be slightly contentious, and I'm very happy mm. to be told I'm wrong. However, I'm going to quote a magnificent and important source, a wonderful and intelligent man uh, by the name of Mark Valdez, who is the director of the Network of Ensemble Theatres, who... They <laughs> 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 do not get a greater authority, I'm told. Um, <laughs> um, and also, the, the things you were saying about, about you know, the, the topic coming first and the need to tell certain stories coming first and the form following, I think also talks to some of this. Um, Mark says, as defined by the Network of Ensemble Theatres, um, and I won't quote the next bit, but then he says, more than aesthetics or structures, our focus is on values, collaboration, inclusion, and multiple perspectives. For many companies, this might manifest in a commitment to social justice and human rights. For others, it merely reflects their own organizational practice where all artists have a stake and a say in the world. These are, for me, all ethical concerns. Now, I'm not for a moment suggesting, I wouldn't want to suggest that thinking of ensemble as a psychophysical action, set of psychophysical action, or ensemble as a set of ethical choices are somehow in any way contradictory to each other. Mm. Absolutely mm. not. Uh, in all the work that I think is really, um, that I know of that is really extraordinary, there is a coming together of what we do, in other words, how we are on stage, with the ethics of how we do it. Uh, Lev Dodin from the Mali Theatre St. Petersburg talked about the Moscow Art Theatre as, I'll misquote him, it said something like a spiritual environment in which theatrical production was an occasional byproduct. <laughs> you know, I, I love that. They were on the process of spiritual inquiry, manifesting in theatre. Grotowski, clearly bringing together ethical dimensions and psychophysical dimensions, Coppo, Brecht bringing together clearly p political and psychophysical, because he did have a whole training process, um, and on and on and on. And I don't know enough about the American scene to know how that's manifesting here, but I'm damn sure it's manifesting extraordinarily, uh, partly because of the quality of work that I see and hear of coming out of America, and also because there is, of course, the whole history in America that you all know way better than I do, which, for me, in some ways is encapsulated in, I think, the most exciting company I know, which is the Open Theatre. Mm -hmm. um, extraordinary bringing together of politics, ethics, and psychophysical inquiry, uh, where form followed exploration of, of, of theme, and theme followed form, and ethics, and politics, and leadership questions, and all of those things. So, I'll be quiet, because I want to try to encourage guests and others to speak. It may be useful for us to think as we talk about ensemble, are we talking about decisions about how we organize and what is and is not acceptable behavior in the rehearsal room? And I don't mean acceptable as in some kind of imposition of morality, but a brief example, in my work as a director, all of my work and training is through a process of positive feedback, entirely, because I don't believe in the, the efficacy and power of, of, of destructive negative feedback. Uh, I know other people who work very strongly from quite kind of, no, 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 no. I absolutely respect that. But I don't work through that. And in my rehearsal spaces when I'm training, I don't want my performers to say, this was terrible, this was awful. I want them always to work from the place of going, this is what I like and this is how we can develop it. So that's an ethics. I'm not saying it's better ethics, it's simply saying these are some things that we do in the spaces that I have responsibility for. Uh, we talk about what we liked and how to develop it, not about what we didn't like. In my space, I don't expect actors to tell other actors how to perform. Uh, I expect actors to take responsibility for their own work, mm. not to try to, in other spaces, it's entirely acceptable for an actor to go, you should try this, you should do it like that. I don't, I don't, I don't work like that. Uh, I'm not saying I'm better. I'm saying it's effective for me and it achieves the results that I am looking for in the ensembles I train. So if people employ me, that's what, you know, what we're looking for. So it may be useful for us to think, are we talking about an ethical choice? Are we talking about a political choice and so on, which is all within the domain of ethics? 
or are we talking about the actions and the training of those actions about what performers actually do when they are in relationship on stage with one another in front of an audience? How do you keep it live? Of course, they lead to the same thing. One second, John. Yeah. Um, uh, Adam and Scott, can you hear me fine? Yes. Yeah, we can hear, yeah, we can hear you. Do you hear us? Yep, but you can't hear John. No? I mean, we can hear, we can hear it comes in and out. It's it's, um, it's, the quality isn't great. We can hear it, but it's, it's, um, it's a little tricky. Yeah. The quality has been all over. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we've lost Rachel, it looks like. So I think the people in the back, just um, just when you do speak for the virtual participants, if you could just speak up, that would, that would be good. And one at a time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Okay, so let me throw this open. I don't know whether Scott or Adam, it looks like Rachel's not there at the moment, I don't know whether Scott or Adam want to jump in immediately, whether anyone else who's prepared somebody wants to jump in or whether we want to just respond. Where do we want to go with this? Maybe we could start Adam, you've been doing some very, um, you said you had some stuff about yeah. the new kind of bridge devising work and some new, new yeah, trends. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I, I have the two areas really I was asked to produce uh, around um, the latest work of the Odin, which is a company I follow very closely. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of assumptions around that group really, uh, or, or ways of working on that group change. Um, it's their 50th anniversary next year, which gives me pause for thought. Um, but, <laughs> um, I'll get back to them, I think, later on, but in my reflecting recently about the ensemble movement in relation to that group, I was trying to compare it with what was going on in the UK, and this, I think, speaks to what John is saying. But it seems to me that too often um, the word ensemble is used as a kind of shorthand, um, and a kind of taxonomy behind that word needs greater exposure. So there is an ethics there. But what do you actually mean when you, when you use the word ensemble? Let me give you very quickly some British examples. Um, what tends to happen um, when, when uh, it's, in, it's in the book, John, uh, when the RSC created an ensemble, uh, Previous to that, the National Thief created an ensemble. It usually means um, bringing together of a group of actors over a set of plays. That's all it means. So there is no psychophysical training. There is no ethics. It's just simply, I suppose, in a in a in a in a, in a German tradition, an older German tradition, how do we keep a group of actors together over a uh, over a set of plays? Um, Peter Mitchell. Um, has broadened that out a little bit. She now keeps um, together, uh, you know, typically around the same lighting designer, the same sound designer, even when she work, works abroad. So what we broadly call creatives now, I don't really like the word, but, but because everybody's creative, so, um, but, but you, know, you know what I mean, are kept together even when she moves abroad. Um, slightly oddly, the Lyric Hammersmith, which is a fantastic theatre in West London, um, has got now a season of what they call secret theatre. I don't think you, if you've encountered this, this is where you book for a play, you don't know what you're booking for. You just buy a ticket, you turn up, and the show happens. Huh. Now, in order to produce the secret theatre, the Lyric Hammersmith has created an ensemble. Now, why they need an ensemble in order to work secretly, I don't know. <laughs> but this seems to be the. Uh, uh, again, a shorthand for we have a we have a, a, a set of actors. More positively, Simon Stevens, um, uh, um, somebody mentioned Chicago. There, he has a play on in Chicago, Motor Town. Um, it, it's the dramaturg for this the secret uh, 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 undertaking of the Derek Hammersley. And he said that unusually, in that space of commercial theatre, what it means is you can behave. Um, not poorly, but you can behave brave, and you can still come back tomorrow morning. And that's very, very freeing for an actor. And you don't get that up in, in more traditional commercial theatre. So, so I, I guess my point is just... that it's too often it's used as a kind of shorthand without exposing the taxonomy behind it. So can we just interrupt a moment? Because yeah. you actually, yeah. we just missed the heart, of, I just missed the heart of what you said. It says you can behave and then come back the next morning. We lost. I lost a word. Really? What was it? Really? You, uh, you, uh, one of the things that uh, the dramaturg of the lyric Hammersmith said was the advantage of the ensemble is that you can behave bravely. Right. You can perhaps um, annoy somebody else. Yeah. 
but you can still come back tomorrow. This is the advantage. Okay, thank you. We so, have Stephen Lee Morris here today. So Hi, Stephen. Hi, <laughs> Scott. How are you? <laughs> How are you? I'm doing a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Strange way to meet. re -meet. Yes, yes. I, I have a... In terms of the question of why here there may be this shift that you're perceiving, I, I got this from a program. I'm afraid the reasons may be more banal than creative. Um, this is from a play I saw last night, which is the opening of Radar LA, actually. It was the Center Theater Group. And this is just from the page, and I'll just read it. It says, Center Theater Group has been awarded a four-year, $1 million grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. The grant will make possible a program focusing on collaboratively created contemporary work from ensembles, divisors, and writers, supporting the creative arc from commissioning through development and production. Wow, um, we got money! Yay! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> now, that, that's not the only, because the James Irvine Foundation has come in, the Doris Duke Charitable Fund has also come in. This is what's really changing the landscape on these shores. And uh, uh, the reasons for it, I can only speculate, is that the, the model that's being replaced has just grown so threadbare. Um, the uh, throw a company together, have them rehearse for six weeks, and then they disband. Um, that is the antithesis of, of the ensemble you're, you're talking about. Um, at the same time, I don't really know what they're talking about here. Yeah. Um, for exactly the reason. Um, I didn't understand any of it. And it was for a show that opened Radar LA, which is the, <coughs> this is our local ensemble generated productions, and it's a one man show by yeah. Luis Alfaro. Uh, one of three solo performances, and I just, um, as a critic, I'm just perplexed by what on earth is going on or what they think they're talking about. <laughs> you know, I, may, I, may I invite Scott Proudfoot Please. to maybe intersect with this because Scott, I know, can you hear me okay? Yes. So Scott, I know that one of the things that you really thought about when you were thinking about the shift away from the collectively creating groups of the 60s and the 70s and the 80s was the rise of performance art and solo performance art and some of the economics which drove that and some of the commodification which drove that and I, you know, I won't keep going because I'd like you to speak to that if, if that's of interest because I think it directly intersects um, you know, with what we just heard. Sure, well, if I'm not putting you in a spot. We brought up in our books is uh, this idea of the core and pool uh, which is uh, you know, going on in, uh, in the UK as well as in the US, but this idea certainly, even when I was in LA, uh, and uh, there are probably people in probably people in the audience that might even talk to this uh, idea that you have a core of people who are truly your ensemble, and then you have this pool of people that you continue to draw on who are uh, members of the ensemble for a certain period of time. And so uh, that seems to be primarily economically driven, though we can see it traced back certainly uh, into the what we, Catherine and I, have been calling the, uh, the sort of second and first waves of collective creations. Uh, so if it is economically driven, it's certainly been going on for a long time. It's not, it's not a new situation, and yet it's made perhaps more visible now than ever before. I, 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 I would I only put one other thought about just this is speaking as a critic, we, and I'm speaking among, a, I realize, a group of practitioners, and you people create work in the light, and the critics create their work in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> we, I think our job is to uh, speak, well, sometimes we, our job is to say, I don't understand that, which is really annoying for the people who created it. Or our job is to say, I did understand it, when in fact, we didn't, and that's even more annoying. <laughs> 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 Um, but from what I can see, I really cannot, I can't wrap my head around what ensemble actually means. It seems to me Moliere's uh, itinerant company was creating work under ensemble conditions as they seem to be defined now. Shakespeare's company yeah. certainly mm -hmm. did. Yes, um, yes. So uh, I, I find this all quite pleasant. The only thing I can notice about the work I've seen in Europe and the work that's being defined as devised an ensemble, this is just from the outside looking in. 
is that there seems to be a different relationship between the text as being a, a, a source, of the, 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 the primary purpose of the creation, whereas in ensemble work, it seems the text is almost more of a decoration. It's an accompaniment. It's a musical accompaniment that doesn't carry as much meaning as in the other model that, it's, that the ensembles have replaced. Or, uh, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Can, I, yeah. can I speak to that? Yeah. Please. Hi, I'm Ben Yalom. Um, I, I think there's sort of two things that you brought up that are very interesting to me. One, the, this question of where the text fits in and the question of the relationship to Moliere, Shakespeare, those models. Those companies were ensembles to a large extent, led however they were. But for the last 60 years in America, we haven't had them for the most part as mainstream companies. Most regional theaters are not run that way. There's an administrative visionary or visioning structure of salary people and then itinerant actors coming in and out, many of whom remain for larger periods of time, hence uh, the, the type of companies that we were just talking about when a, when a larger, like ACT in San Francisco, has a pool of actors or has a number of actors who are on staff all year round. Is that an ensemble? I don't think it is in the terminology that we're using it here. Um, but in the terminology that we're using here, that at least the, my understanding is the question, as you know, I just walked in. Um, the, the question that's on the table and the, and the way that I think of ensemble in, in the current American landscape uh, I think this question of t where text fits in is, it, it often is the way you're describing it, but I don't think it by any chance, by any means has to be. Mm -hmm. So there are many ensembles who will work with existing scripts. Um, my company, Fool's Fury, does both de so-called devised work and scripted work. Um, I think of the ensemble as being uh, a group of people who have committed to working together on the creative and the administrative aspects over time. And so to that end, we, we do a festival every couple of years, coming up soon, Fury Factory. Um, and we're really interested in the question of what is a solo show in an ensemble context. And I think that there, there's, I don't think there's a contradiction there in principle. In reality, perhaps there often is. But it is certainly possible to collaboratively work with a group of people you have been artistic partners in partnership for a long time on what this show is, regardless of the number of people performing it. That most, how do most one-person shows happen? Well, it's one person, maybe a director. So, I don't think that I don't think being a one-person show makes you an ensemble in any way, but I think it is possible to be an ensemble creating a one-person show. And, it, and I'd like, I want to get back. To, I'd like to get back to Adam in a moment just to talk about Odin. Um, but uh, the, picking up on that, and maybe Adam, you might want to uh, contribute to this. Can you hear me okay there? Uh, I can. Yeah. Okay. Do, do you want me to? Uh, to I'll just I'll just lead I'll that. just lead into something here because just picking up on what you were just saying. My sense, from my position as someone who trains ensembles, which therefore by definition means what I'm doing is I'm training performers. It's a psychophysical thing. It's about how you use your body in space. Uh, I don't train structures. I train bodies. Um, but my sense, in training in ensemble, you are also training to be an extraordinary solo performer because you learn about relationship. You learn about relationship to audience. You learn about relationship to space, to music, to imaginary characters on stage. And so on. And I'm very aware that coming out of Odin, where you know, for 50 years some of them have been training together, Julia Valley in, in my book writes a short section on what it's like to have worked with people for 50 years. <laughs> wow! I mean, it's an extraordinary thing. And there's two things that seem to me really interesting there. One, they have followed their individual trajectories together, and including many solo shows emerging from that. And secondly, I've forgotten the second really interesting thing that emerged from that. <laughs> 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 it wasn't quite as interesting as I thought. Um, secondly, and, and again, Adam, you may want to talk to this. So, yeah. The individual dramaturgy intersecting. The individual dramaturgy intersecting, maybe. We, we, may want to, we may well want to go there, but I also just want to see if you might bring up, I was chatting with Tim Etchells, the uh, artistic director of uh, Fran not Fran Forced, Disney, Entertainment. Forced Entertainment, thank you. Uh, I was chatting with Tim a little while ago, uh, and Tim was saying, you know, not a hope in hell that a group could do what Forced Entertainment have done now in England. They got mm -hmm. together in the early 80s, and they've been hanging out together for 30 years. 
like a lot of us, you know, my art subsidy for the first 10 years was unemployment benefit. The economic situation has changed. It's not possible now. I don't know whether a company like Odin is possible now. So what might those organizational structures, how might they, without saying we, knowing that we can't necessarily do that now, how might what Julia and people like Tim and some of the really long-lasting companies that exist yeah. in America, how can they tell us today about how we might organize? I don't know whether you have things you might want to throw in there. I throw the a thorny question as we go yeah, forward. Yeah, yeah. And it's back here on the board. And it's, yeah. what are we, you know, it's, I think we need to unpack it slowly over time. But I'm hearing a conflation of terms in a way that may not be productive for us. And it's not that any of these terms have fixed meanings, but we may want to come to some ethical agreements about usage. Repertory companies, ensemble companies, collectives, devising, just the word company. I hear a blending starting to happen that may be producing more confusion than, than clarity. Just, just out there, Mark, do, what is the network of ensemble theaters definition of ensemble? group of artists who work over uh, a long period of time uh, to create a, a unique body of work where artists and administrators have direction in the, uh, into the future of the organization. So, so you know, I remember it being very important that we added administrators into that definition. Uh, Can you say that again? Uh, a okay. group of individuals. <laughs> yeah, Adam, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear. Um, uh, uh, yeah, let me try and address that through, through this lens of the building. Um, I think you're absolutely right, Catherine. I, I think that the, the, the very big question of taxonomy behind this word ensemble, and sometimes it's kind of um, too casual appropriation uh, without thinking through the ethics of those taxonomies. Specifically in terms of the only what you have to remember uh, the, the, there are two things that define that group. Um, one is its training, and they, they were brought together specifically to train together. Um, that training now doesn't continue. They don't train together anymore. Um, you know, they're, they're old and they're, <laughs> and they're so deeply uh, psychophysical in such a state that that one can reach, and they don't do it anymore. Um, I'll come back to that point. The second point, of course, is that they are a laboratory, and specifically Brutovsky's uh, definition of the notion of laboratory. Um, now, what that means is um, that there are a, a place of investigation, but also of wide activities as well. But underpinning that, and in some way to answer John's question, um, in order to do that today, there has to be a willingness to stay together. And Julia Valley seizes on that term, ensemble, as meaning together, right? You have to be willing to stay together. There is a danger in that, because what will those urban actors do outside of that ensemble? They can't do anything. In a way, it's that they're, they're, they're caught in this world of their own volition. Um, but um, there is a wide definition of ensemble I think worth seizing on here as well. And Julia in the book talks about this job. But, Ensemble for the Odin um, simply means a, a, a full cast show. Um, but the, 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 the group, which is a term she prefers, um, has to be seen as part of a network. So throughout their tradition as a laboratory, they always um, had meetings, such as you know we're having uh, 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 this afternoon and tonight uh, in my world. Um, hmm. And they've always flipped. But going back to what Catherine said, that, that there is um, a huge tension at the, the, the heart of um, the enemy. And that is, how can you be part of a group, but how can you be an individual as well? So John talks about self with others. How can you be yourself, but how can you be with others as well? And that's really something which drives that group. They can't stay together at the time they drive each other mad. So periodically, uh, there are certain points in the year where they, where they, they uh, dissipate and they can make that sort of work, they can go and train and so on. Um, so that's how they, they've managed to, to, to kind of continue really by almost not being an ensemble, not trying to stay together. You, you can go and make your sort of work. Um, but it's a real tension which drives that work. Remember as well, that group is run by a very, very strong charismatic director. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we keep that group together, financially, uh, ethically, everything. Uh, and this is something we might come back to, actually, is, is how the rank um, uh, work with an ensemble at the group. Of course, it depends on the circumstances. But I've sat in rehearsals with um, Eugenio Barber. Nobody questions him. If he makes a montage in a certain way, that's the way it is. But he's absolutely reliant on his incredibly well-trained uh, actors bringing him the source material. And if they don't bring him that, he's stuck. So the way, to, really to answer John's question, the way that group functions is still into the 21st century is a kind of network of tension between uh, the group, the part of the networks, which is what Julia talks about in the book, between a very strong director um, a, a, and a group of actors who are incredibly well trained. Um, yes, they've been going for 50 years, but really the core of that group have been together since the 70s. Um, so it's more like, it's not quite 50 years, it's more like 40. But very interestingly, um, I, I think um, each of that group's survival in the 21st century is um, a sense of looking out to networks and how they hand on their traditions to young people. Um, and that's my criticism of the UK uh, turn on someone, that you know, they're doing all this stuff for three years about working on plays as a group, but there's no speaking out to a wider context. Um, uh, but that's where they're at at the moment. I mean, uh, uh, they're, they're doing increasingly uh, 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 work in the community, increasing work with young people. They really are broadening out, um, and that's how they survive. Um, that's a very long way around to answer those questions, John. Uh, Fantastic. But I think, Thank I think you. It's, a, it's about tensions. There's, there's just an interesting. Can I add something? Yeah. So go, Scott. Uh, yeah, so, uh, in when we were comparing our work, we were talking about how this uh, these books on collective creation was kind of a long time. Uh, struggling with the definition. Uh, and, you know, we like it, but in the same situation we're having in room right now, we wanted to make sure that we kept the definition broad enough to account for the unbelievable multiplicity we were finding in practices that were defined as collective creation, but sort of limited enough so that we didn't just uh, collapse into the complete relativism and say, well, all theaters collaborate, therefore everything is collective creation of one type or another. And that's sort of the same uh, danger we have uh, with ensemble, but I liked. Uh, sort of John's uh, discussion at the beginning, looking at these uh, uh, two ideas of the, the psychophysical act and also ethical choices as, as ways to start mapping uh, types of ensemble activity. Um, you know, can we find things that uh, draw continuities across, for example, uh, you see a Broadway production in which a company's been assembled by uh, producer and the directors that perhaps never work together, will not work together again, rehearses for four weeks with a script in which no word has changed. If you see that production and there's some sort of shared moment, uh, uh, John, I think there's sort of a shared breath, something that happens between actors on stage, is ensemble occurring then, even if there's no ethical element at all. Uh, on the other hand, if, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, you know, you have collectives that devise productions together, with uh, lives together, uh, create with no set schedule, uh, perhaps uh, never even presents uh, finished work. And, and, you know, can you say that there's something in common across those things? Is that ensemble in both those situations? And uh, I think well, what I would propose from recent research that I'm doing uh, as we work on this uh, next book, Catherine, on uh, women culture creation, is that uh, one of the ways to start getting at what ensemble is, is uh, that I'm finding, or I, I believe I'm finding, that uh, ensemble often occurs uh, when there is a true opportunity in the preparation or presentation uh, for play, uh, and an encouragement to play. Um, and then, you know, this idea of play is, uh, is specifically, for me, in, in, in this context, coming out of uh, the women who worked in the uh, social work movement uh, in the settlement houses uh, in the U.S. Uh, at the turn of the century, from the 1900s to the 1920s. We find it mirrored in France. Of, yeah, there's a play. Um, and uh, I, I won't go into detail in terms of the research, but I, I think what it raises is uh, a bunch of questions about how, and this goes back to Stephen 
Stephen and Daniel, I think, were talking about what, what text can be present or not, or what that does to a, a situation in terms of ensemble. Um, among theater makers and within theater companies, you know, what conditions or elements need to exist for play to occur to be a, a, a possibility? And, those, I, and I think that you, you find that those things that prevent play can also facilitate play. Things like time, hierarchies, uh, economics, texts, cultural climate, training space, all of these things can prevent play from happening and therefore perhaps prevent ensemble, but they can also facilitate it depending on the specific situation. That was a lot of talking from virtual. I'm Johnny Corn, and uh, I, as I said last night, I, I was part of that movement back in the 60s and 70s with that collective way of approaching what do we have to say. I'm also a 20-year member plus of Antius, which began, yeah. like your group, uh, Jose, at, at, at the taper, when the taper said, we want Kenneth Branagh style ensemble theater here. And we, <laughs> Gordon put together a remarkable group of actors, of which I was extremely fortunate, because I came in and did a comedian workshop. And they said, we need that. <laughs> And so I was suddenly a member of the company. And it was a, a group of professionals who wanted to work a lab, create an ensemble for Gordon, and do new work with classical theater. And we did one play, The Wood Demon, and it was not financially successful. And we did something else. Uh, we pioneered uh, double casting, which is another thing I wanted to address about your idea of the, the the cycle side of things. Because when you <laughs> double, double cast, you not only are collaborating with a, a cast, but you're also collaborating with a partner who's doing the same role you're doing, and they're not going to do it exactly the same way, but you still have to honor the text. And you all have to be unified. And, some, and that's been our, our exploration ever since, and we're less that now but that dynamic is still there. We've gone through lots of permutations of structure, survival. We had Dakin Matthews who sort of kept us together. We had Lillian Garrett Grove in the early days. But now, you know, we decided we needed a, a more traditional structure and we've been moving through variations on that. But the core thing that at Antius today is, uh, an actor will say, I want to, I want to deal with the text and they'll put together a group of, of members and they'll do a reading and then they'll develop to a workshop and that might turn out to be one of the shows we do. That's the drive. So the ethics side of it is not as, in fact, that's one of my big things I keep trying to bring in from the old days is that kind of ethical sense of, of why are we doing this? Well, why, you know, which has been my, my thing, drives me nuts all the time. Why, why bother? <laughs> You know, and I think I think ensembles, which is a huge open pit uh, of, of, of trying to define what it is, but I think ensembles are often people who say, I want to do something. I want to do something. And then they begin to explore it. And if they can hold together for a while, it'll be there. But the other element here is that, like the Beatles, uh, you know, things change. And this is an art that is alive and it's not going to stay together necessarily. I mean, the Odin staying together for 50 years, remarkable, you know, uh, but it's gone through its changes, hasn't it? Uh, and, and, and as all, all of them will. And that's part of the other process of, of how ensemble is addressed at different stages of a development of a group. John Collins, the director of the um Elevator of Hair Service writes a chapter in this one, and he ends it, I think, really interestingly, he said the most successful ensembles were always falling apart. Yeah, and For me, there's right. something profoundly right. important about that, that as soon as the ensemble, in any form, whether this is organizational, psychophysical, political, whatever, as soon as the ensemble reaches stasis, right. it's dead. Because as Krishnamurti, the Indian thinker, says, everything flows. It's got to flow. Yeah, yeah. And so it's got to be falling apart. And from the falling apart, there is the new, the new evolution and the new genesis. So this sense of somehow we, that's why I, in the end I reject the idea of ensemble as a thing. We are an ensemble. 
I kind of think of ensemble as a process. And it's a process that happens second by second on stage. Uh, because it's continually in the state of crisis. Uh, and in this magnificent way, because that's what makes it live. You're constantly negotiating the unexpected. Constantly having to go, you just did what I didn't expect and I have both the training and the ethical framework to know how appropriately to react to you. Not just any reaction, but the reaction that serves this ensemble making this work of art here now for this audience. So it is that sense of continual decay and the strength in a performer and I would suggest the strength in directors and writers and, and everybody else who's involved in the collaborative process to say, you know this great thing what I made? It's falling apart. <laughs> Magnificent, hallelujah. Now we have new life and new birth. And when the writer goes, no, hold on, this is my play. Or when the, the, the designer goes, this is my scenography. Then we kind of get to what for me moves away from the notion of ensemble, and I'm really trying not to be prescriptive here, uh, but it seems to me there is this need for continual genesis and evolution. Yeah, well, me and, like I said, we've been together for almost 20 years. It, it changes, it moves, and you know, I mean, we came from the collective, when the collective is nobody has ownership of anything. Okay, I mean, it was like, yeah, we live in the same house. We ate together, you know, I set a line, and that line became owned by the company, you know, or whatever, to become a, a, an ensemble, what we call an ensemble, which means it's a, a lot of more responsibilities than just being a collective. By the way that now you as an individual inside this ensemble have a lot of responsibilities mm -hmm. to the company, you know, to the ensemble. And we work with a lot, of, and it's hard in, the, in, in, in LA because people say, you never cast anybody out, you always cast the same people. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're not a production company, we're an ensemble. Yeah. You know, or ensemble is created in order, understanding that we're coming from the 60s when there were no playwrights, there were no individual playwrights in Chicano theater except with Valdez. So we, it was a need to create pieces of work to talk about their community because nobody else was writing, you know? In the 80s, when the, the playwrights started coming out of Yale, the, from the, mass, the schools, they were talking about not the needs of the community, but it was something else. So it didn't fit our ensemble type, you know? Mm. And we're still together, and now, the, the process of the ensemble, I mean, I'm the artistic director because it's the structure of how American theater works, and you have to have these type of ideas, but most decisions, even though it's a bigger, it's, it's a bigger group of people, are made by the ensemble. But this means we have to get together <coughs> and say this is what the season is going to do. Mm -hmm. This is what we are going to, everybody has a different responsibility as an individual, like if somebody who's an actor, but he's a very good producer, I have somebody who's an actor, who's a very good writer, you know what I mean? That, so they, everybody takes a responsibility on the ensemble. And yes, we work with a lot of other people, but they all train together. You, you, you know what I mean? I mean it's, it, it has changed. We're talking about the paper, and I was gonna, because we just got commissioned by them as, one of the ensembles to do one of the projects. You know, and of course, the way the original theaters work, they do the contract usually with the playwright or the director. And we have to go to the lawyers to say, you're doing a contract with the company. And not necessarily just with the playwright and the director, because the company in a way has a, an unreal ownership of, of, the, of the work that is going to happen, and we don't have to go into the idea who's going to be cast yeah. on the main stage. And how many people was this, Jose? How many people was your company at that time? Right now? No, at that time, how many people was your company? When, that, when you made this contract with, with Taper? No, right now. Oh, yeah. right, now. Right, now. Yeah. right now, I mean, for, uh -huh. for this ensemble money that they got, mm -hmm. uh, I see. this is new. I mean, uh -huh. When I did it, 
In 92, when they closed the LATC, we moved the entire company right, to right. the paper yeah, yeah. when, when yeah. all this idea was created. And, uh, you know, we were there, but we, it, we, we didn't fit, really. We so, so even no, today, you're, you're struggling to, to, no, to, no. to, to inform <laughs> the taper that you're a company, that they're still, their models are still looking at individuals. Well, the original theater models are, yeah. are really hard to fit something like an ensemble. It, it, and the problem is that they say, you're brilliant, I should get you cavalry here and work with me. And because of the economics, right. you say, you're right, my ensemble, <laughs> I'm leaving. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's harder to say, yeah. no, 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 no. Yeah. We have worked together for three years, and now we need to get contracts with the ensemble and not with the individual. You want me by telling everybody. That's right. That's right. That's right. I would like to add something to the conversation. I think that the, this is just for me personally, I'm Crystal. Um, um, I think that the we year we get about what ensemble is, the more we turn not only each other off, but other people from outside. We say, oh, no, 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 no. Ensemble is this. Ensemble is this. It's like, when I first started in the world of, like, I'm just creating, I'm, ha I'm playing, having a good time, like, let's create something. And then it's like you start to move in deeper, and then all of a sudden people try to define what it is for you. They try to tell you, no, what you're doing isn't what we do is. Or, oh, actually, that, I'm sorry, you know, creating the way you create. You know, like, when you start to get into that world, I think that starts to get really tricky and turn people off. I think if a, bu a bunch of people are working together, and they are moving forward to create and tell a story, whether that be movement or text or whatever that is, and they have a functioning model that works for them, whether they have someone who's in charge of it or it's all you know, um, collaborative completely, or I think that's an amazing thing, and that's, you know, that's a beautiful thing to move forward and, and to acknowledge that um, from other people. And that's just like, like I said, a personal thing. It's just like for a while I was kind of turned off by, by speaking to certain ensemble people because they were very much like very precious about what ensemble was and very much like, no, what other people do is not. We're one of the only LA theater companies that are ensemble because we exist. It's like, oh my goodness gracious. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other thing that I want to add to it is, is um, you know, you were saying, I don't know if Odin would be able to stick around um, or uh, a company would be able to, to start like that. I'm not extremely familiar with Odin, but I kind of feel like ensemble work right now is in such a beautiful place in the United States because we are the sticker-outers. When the, when the economy went bad, we're the people who are committed to what we are doing. We are creating these amazing stories, and we are sticking together. We didn't have a space to begin with because we didn't have money for one, so we don't have the overhead, and we don't have to deal with the same things. And so, and that's not everybody, but some people do still have overhead and whatnot. But you know, um, but I think that it's like it's this exciting time, and there's this regional model that's kind of a little bit cr not crumbling, but it's, it's 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 wearing. It's part of the institution now, and now all of a sudden they don't have the money, so they're like, um, we would like to do a full production. Yes. Oh, we would like to bring you in if possible for our season. And we're in a really fantastic, exciting time right now in the states. Uh, I can't speak to other places for, for ensemble work right now. I'm so excited about crisis, where we're going yeah. right now. In the crisis, I think the opportunities for for those of us who are working outside the mainstream and trying to find new ways are enormous, absolutely enormous. Yeah. So, I can't remember who I was chatting with this morning, but somebody was saying, "This is." I was with Mark, who I want to bring in next. Uh, it is the time where I, my feeling, okay, this is based on nothing, but my feeling is that we will look. Oh, I won't. I'll be dead. But people will look back <laughs> 60 years from now and realise that the work that was being done now was the foundation of what revolutionized things 10 years from now. In the same way as I, you know, people look at the 1960s and go, amazing work. That work started in the 40s and 50s. Yes, the in the 30s, actually, yeah, and, and then there was a and, war. And back and back and back. You know, the living theater comes from 1948, is it 47, 48? Uh, something like that. You know, who had their roots in Piscalter, who was doing it before? So, it was back yes, back. now is the time when we go, hallelujah, do the work, because it's great to be doing, and, we are laying in place the things that will alter our culture ten years from now. I mean, I, I probably wouldn't benefit from it. I'll be dead before any of this stuff. Hours, but great, you know, I'm having a great time now. So I'm. <laughs> but I do think absolutely that there is this need, as we work through things, unconditionally to celebrate our ability to survive and to make. And can, on that score, just to try to get diversity of voices, can I bring in Mark uh, from the Network of Ensemble Theatres, who can maybe talk a little bit about? some of that stuff, because you maybe have an overview of a huge range of things here. 
I um the, the title of the session or this was called what does ensemble mean in the twenty first century? And and um I, I think I have took a very different take of that question. That, that my 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 thoughts on the question were not about definitions, uh, uh, but more about relevance. Uh, like, like, what is its, it's, it's significance? It, its use now, uh, uh, and I think that's the part of the conversation that, that I'm particularly interested in. I, I kind of uh, share share Crystal's feelings. Uh, 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 the definitions, the, the minute we start to define it, like next definition, we have often are being criticized because it's so broad. It is very intentionally broad. Uh, 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 if we could make it broader, I would be happy to do that. Because it's just um, the minute you start to define the, the, all of, you can't, you can't limit aesthetics, you can't limit form, you can't limit, you start to take away the very same, the, the very impulses that lead to its creation, that lead to its to to its being. So, um, so, so the definitions are, are, are for me kind of less interesting. But what I get excited about is is it's uh, the implications of of the form of this practice of this thing uh, uh, that, that we've been trying to try to try to kind of wrestle with. Um, the I don't know where, oh, so uh, where I was going to go with this is. Um, we're in a moment of movements. That, that there's something about the agency that allows, that, 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 that is, is very, um, that ensembles allow. I mean, it's something I think Adam was talking about, about the, the individual and the ensemble. And you can, the ensemble, the group, allows for the development of the individual. And in, and, in, uh, and in developing the individual, you're developing the group. And it's that symbiosis. Like, like you can't you can't separate those two, uh, and I think there's something in this moment of of, of of participation of voice of agency that uh, that is especially alluring and uh, 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 and it draws people to 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 this way of making art. Um, there's also the very practicalities of it's it's easier to do it with somebody than to do it by yourself. <laughs> uh, and it's more yeah. fun. Yeah, absolutely. And it's more like yeah. life. Yeah. yeah. And so, so the, 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 there's something in the just like um, something about that, that that just allows it to even happen. That 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 relies on on a body, on a group. Uh, and the last thing uh, uh, I will say is uh, people, individuals, group. Uh, that that. Uh, I agree that, that somebody said, like, like can, can a company be around for 50 years? I, and, and my sense, and I, I really love what John was talking about, in that you're always in a state of falling apart, that, that increasingly you're seeing there's not a purity in, in the, it's these five people, and these five people are the ensemble. Like, that, I see that less and less and less and less and less the model. That I think there's a core that is constantly bringing in people, is constantly figuring out how they go in and out, and just I mean, whether it's just life realities, economic realities, aesthetic interests, personal interests, whatever the reasons. Um, I think that the this this yeah, I, I think there's just the, the, it this it's evolving. And, 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 and there's something in the, the livingness of these of these bodies that, that, that is also interesting. So I don't know, um, just talk about that. Thank you. I, I just want to get back to the thorny question, an interesting question, and I think you've heard of a productive question of definitions. Um, because I think, no, because I think that what it does is it brings us to precisely where you just went with us. That when we keep pushing it, well, what do you mean? We move from definitions to articulations, right? So that. The terms themselves are slippery because they mean different things to different people. And they also become ways that people raise money. They become things we try to teach. They become things that we use for self-promotion to get jobs. They become all sorts of things. So, so the definitions are loaded and complicated and they have a kind of social life to them, which is why they're worth picking at. And at the same time, that picking up can become a competition of, no, my ensemble's more ensemble than your ensemble, right? <coughs> but it leads to starting to clear the words away and saying, this is where the passion is. So it can be a very productive conversation if oh, we yeah. keep returning to it. Yeah. 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 Yeah
I think the broadness of it was what I was saying. I wasn't saying we should define it. I mm -hmm. was saying like if you try to define it narrowly, I think that's very scary. Absolutely. Yes, very I scary. Say. Yes. May I just stretch this out a little bit? We're running a little bit towards the end of time. There's a lot of people who perhaps are working at, in younger companies, developing work, um, whose voices we haven't heard in this particular discussion yet. Is there anyone who kind of listening in who's going, yeah, hold on, there's this is why I talk about ensemble, this is why I come to something about ensemble, this is what it means to me. Yeah. I don't talk about ensemble, and I don't really care what's an ensemble, what's not. <laughs> I, you said some really things that spoke to me very directly, just like, what do I have to say? And what's the, what's the form that's appropriate for me to say? And, and for me, that's been like a totally hermetic, monastic theater people in Europe, also a rock band that toured a lot, um, now is like a evolving ensemble of people from Places. Um, and none of that had anything to do with I care about this particular thing because I think it's the right political choice from a point of view of like stepping outside. It's like what is my problem? What are the problems of the people that I'm working with and the problems of the communities that we're working in? And how can we deal with that? Okay, this board will solve this set of problems. You know, we can, I mean, a lot of it's economic. I'm Michael Hunter, but I, I was just thinking a lot about this definition that you gave us, a proposed definition of thinking about the psychophysical relationships on stage. And I keep thinking that that might offer a more robust language actually for spectators and critics to think about what they see in ensemble, because it's placing the emphasis on how those relationships behind the scenes are manifesting the work itself. And um, I don't know if anybody's read Claire Bishop's book on participatory art, it's called Participatory Health, but she has, <laughs> <laughs> she has this great, this great <laughs> argument <laughs> from, from the perspective of an art critic where she's basically talking about um, a lot of, like a sort of recent vogue for participatory art, and that if art critics are reifying, which they have been recently from her perspective, um, the sort of ethical makeup of the work itself, the behind the scenes, like a, a lack of hierarchy being the model of the best, then what is evacuated from that is any possibility of actually talking about the work itself and what it does, and any way of measuring quality that one piece may be better than another, but it actually does more. And there's something I'm really interested in this, yeah. in this definition, because we're not just saying, well, ensemble is about this set of hierarchical relationships, but saying, if you work in a certain way, which is along the lines of what Catherine was talking about this morning, a long counter tradition, you see something deeper on stage, and then you can start to talk about how it looks in particular productions. I think we, we should just pause it right there, a little, little cesura. Um, thank our virtual guests, uh, Scott and Adam, and unfortunately Rachel, we lost, but has been hopefully watching on live stream. Um, thank you for both, thank both you, for joining us, thank and um, we'll, we'll catch up with you later. And, um, great. Uh, and then I just wanted to, um, this has been an excellent point because uh, Catherine's kind of thrown out a provocation here. Michael's just going on a provocation. Ace is throwing out a very different provocation about, well, why are we even, why are we even care? And so <laughs> we wanna, before, we, before we take a break for lunch, we just want to uh, open up the beginning for the next round afterwards. So the next round afterwards, we are implementing something that I'm only an expert as a participant. I never actually had to facilitate this. And I'm scared, absolutely scared. I don't know how I'm going to do this. But I can just give you the idea of what open space technology did for me when I went to devoted and disgruntled theater gatherings in London that now are happening all over the UK. Um, and what it is is basically opportunity for a everyone in the room who has something that they really want to raise as a question, as a or as a point, or as a concern, or anything. Uh, that they can actually come in the circle in the middle, state that, and there's going to be a wall, we will transform it over lunch, and they will have then a chance to go and pick the spot, the place, and the time, which we have so limited, because usually this event takes three days, and of course, 
over 400 people show up there, and it's three days, and it's one and a half hour long sessions, and it's huge halls. We have everything much smaller in a much smaller ways. We may have, hopefully, we'll have so many questions, we will not have enough ways to divide the group. All of a sudden, we're all going to be in our little spots. We will figure it out, because I think I, I'll come up with something brilliant over lunch. <laughs> How we can solve this. But what I would like to encourage all of you is when you go over lunch, or you talk to friends, or you, you go with lunch, um, whatever you do, when you come back, um, please uh, don't hesitate to raise a point that you're willing then to hold the space with. You will go to the wall, you'll pick the spot, and you'll pick the time. We'll have two sessions, 45 minutes each, which is half the time that usually open space technology wants to give. So it's 45 minutes that you will have a chance to explore with whoever is gonna come to your space. And that may be just you, because somebody else uh, has something that all of a sudden the whole group goes there. That normally doesn't happen. Usually, if we have at least six, seven spaces that we're going to have here today, you will find at least one person coming. But if it's you, just you, that's a beautiful moment because you can actually really ask yourself these questions and write down what your answers are. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, so these are the principles. Whoever comes are the right people. Whenever it starts is the right time as well because sometimes what happened to me is that I was sitting by myself. And I'm sitting by myself, and I'm sitting by myself, and then about half an hour later, and I was writing my stuff and just doing things, about half an hour later, people started to trickle in, trickle in, trickle in. And then the conversation flared up, and it was fantastic. And then about 15, 20 minutes later, it was over. And I felt like, yeah, it's been accomplished. And I actually closed my station, and I went to other stations to hear what people are talking about. So. Whenever it starts is the right time, wherever it happens is the right place, because all of a sudden, you may find yourself actually having that, those questions answered by, by the teapot, or like by, by, having, you know, by having cookies, and the conversation ensues. So it's not necessarily always at the station. It kind of has this open space technology means you may just go to lunch and that, whatever it really matters to you, you you're talking to a waiter. <laughs> and that somehow um, happens to be the answer to your question or your concern. Whatever happens is the only thing that could happen. <laughs> and when it's over, it's over. <laughs> and we know it. So, a couple of things. When you come back, we'll initiate you just a little bit more into this because it has kind of this freedom that people can be butterflies. You can. You can go and peek into a conversation. It doesn't quite jive with you. You can just move to another conversation. Some people can be uh, bumblebees. They hear something here, and then they go to another station. Oh, they're talking about, oh, guys, I have to tell you, because those people are actually covering this topic. So there is that type of event that we would like to experiment with in its early kind of gestation stages in the afternoon that will lead to the practical then sessions in the later part of the evening with um, Rafael Lopez Barantes on vocal training oh. mm. and with Mora on vocal training. <laughs> we can really then speak and voice <laughs> our concerns in a beautiful way. Then going into the Putanani session where all of our backgrounds can start mixing mm -hmm. and um, to end the day. Um, so Thank you. <laughs> so before you guys go, quickly, uh, just think of something that you, most matters to you to talk of this afternoon. Uh, and you may want to hold that spot or somebody else just ask that question and you know you're going to go and talk there with them. Uh, so where can you have lunch? I, my highest recommendation is right across the street here is eat this. They gave us 10% discount. So when you go, they say it's around the teapot, 10% discount, they'll give you that. They, they have fantastic food, really, really good food. If you are on a slightly more budget that, that the place is, they're not terribly expensive. I can tell you that if you get side orders, 
side salads, you can get amazing tuna salad, beet salad, whatever. Those are really cheap. Those are like between four and six dollars. The sandwiches, they come huge. Like, and you can share, by the way. The sandwiches are huge, the salads are huge. Those are 12 bucks. Um, if you want to be on a budget, 